All right, good afternoon. Oh, goodness, okay. <laughs> good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Humanities Forum, which is always on Friday afternoon. I've seen a lot of you here before, so I don't need to give too much of an introduction uh, with that. Um, this afternoon, we are welcoming Christine Wohar, who is a graduate of Vanderbilt University at School of Law. She holds an MBA from the University of Pittsburgh, and she was first introduced to Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati by her parish priest, Father John Sims Baker, in 1996. Ten years later, she met one of Frassati's nieces in Rome and made a life-changing decision. Working closely with the Frassati family, she founded Frassati USA, a nonprofit organization that works to promote spirit, the spirituality of Pier Giorgio and to further his cause for canonization. She hosted a three-part EWTN series, Sanctity Within Reach, Pier Giorgio Frassati, featuring an in-depth discussion with Blessed Frassati's niece and it has also appeared on EWTN's Life on the Rock, EWTN Live, Bookmark, At Home with Jim and Joy, and Women of Grace, as well as being interviewed for many other television and radio programs, podcasts, and print publications. She's the author of Finding Frassati and Following His Path to Holiness, co-editor of the book Pier Giorgio Frassati, Letters to His Friends and Family, and producers of the videos Pier Giorgio Frassati, Get to Know Him, and Giorgio, A Modern Day Miracle Story. She's considered a world expert on Blessed Frassati and has given presentations to audiences of all sizes in the US, Canada, Italy, England, and Austria. So today she is here to tell us more about this wonderful person. Thank you. Terrific. How are my, my sound is okay? Great. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction, which mostly I wrote, I guess. Um, <laughs> no, it's on, the, it's on the website, I think. So um, anyway, uh, just having an introduction like that, at least you know that uh, hopefully that I do kind of know what I'm talking about. So I'm not going to give you some bad information today. Um, I have never set foot in Rhode Island until this morning, this afternoon, I guess, 1230. So this is really great for me to be here and to have my first experience of Rhode Island being here at Providence College. Otherwise, the only thing I knew was like your basketball team. So there's other people here. It's great, and it's good to meet you. I want to thank Professor Keating for taking over for the introduction, for uh, Professor Hain for inviting me, and Pam Belcher for arranging all of my accommodations and travel. And it's very providential in a way to be here this week because it's, we just celebrated the Feast of All Saints and All Souls, and so it's an extra good reason to be having this kind of a presentation. When I looked at the topics that you've had on the schedule for the Humanities Forum, I kind of felt like this is going to be Humanities Forum light today. Um, definitely not in the level of some of the incredible speakers that have been here. But this one, I hope, will be challenging to you in a special way because um, something just to reflect seriously on your place in the world, perhaps, uh, more of a personal kind of a presentation or an impact. I am Catholic. I'm actually Byzantine Catholic. And I'm talking about a Latin rite, blessed, so it's a little bit unusual. I'm not a theologian, and I'll be willing to stand corrected by anybody who, if I go rogue on anything theological. So we'll get started. I like to start with a, a prayer. It's a Catholic college, so I hope that's okay. I just would like to ask for the Blessed Mother's intercession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Blessed Peter of Georgia, pray for us. So I'm going to talk about 50 minutes and basically go through Pier Giorgio's life story, assuming that you may not know much about him. It's kind of introductory, obviously can't cover everything, but we'll hit the high points. And then I'll have a little pop quiz with prizes at the end, and we have time for a Q&A. So the first thing is that the theme of Blessed Pier Giorgio is uh, that this talk is finding him and following his path to holiness. It's, that's pretty much all we're going to talk about. One of the problems I think we have when we consider holiness is this. We think of people that look like this. Um, you have great saints in the Dominican tradition here, St. Dominic, St. Albert, St. Catherine of Siena, you know, on and on. But we think of holiness as something reserved for them 
or something reserved for the people wearing habits, religious priests and nuns. And we can distance ourselves from that concept of what it means to be holy. Um, I like to think that there's, uh, I, I like to call them the super saints, you know, these saints that had the stigmata or bilocated or founded religious communities or they were popes or something like that. But the thing about it is that's really not how these people grew up. When they grew up, they might have looked more something like this, right? Regular, everyday people. And one thing that all of these people have in common is... They were either raised Catholic, attended Catholic schools, are still Catholic now, or fallen away Catholics. But everyone on this slide has a real Catholic um, beginning in a certain sense. So when you think of, when I say holiness, do these people pop into your mind in the same way as those other people pop into your mind? But remember that expression, right? Every saint, every, uh, saint has a past and every sinner has a future. So those people on the first slide didn't walk around in robes and halos when they were working their way out, the working out their sanctity, their holiness. And the, the end, end game for any of these people is uncertain, right? Because we're all on that journey. So this is why I love the story of Pier Giorgio Frassati. Because he kind of, I think, transitions us from that thought process of those saints on that first slide to our lives today. That, uh, holiness is possible for us. When he was beatified, Pope John Paul II said, he testifies that holiness is possible for everyone. Particularly, holiness is possible for you. I think I'll move over since most we're, left, we're leaning over here. Is it okay that I stand over here? Um, so holiness is possible for you. So we're going to go through his story of holiness, the life of blessed Pier Giorgio. And here he is, little baby Pier Giorgio in the arms of his father, Alfredo. Pier Giorgio was born on April 6, 1901. He, it was Holy Saturday. It was 7 p.m. The church bells were ringing for the vigil mass of Easter Sunday. So it was a glorious time. But there was a problem. Pier Giorgio came out a little bit blue. He had third-degree asphyxiation. And they were worried that he might not survive. It was a real fear for the Frassati family because they had already lost a daughter at the age of eight months. A lot of people don't know that Pier Giorgio had an older sister, but she died at eight months old before he was born. So they actually had an emergency quick baptism the following day, which was Easter Sunday. So Pier Giorgio was baptized on Easter Sunday, and then the rite of baptism was completed many months later with godparents in a more official way. So what do we call this little boy? A big problem. His father liked the name Pietro, which is Peter in Italian. His father's father, his, so Mr. Frassati's father was Pietro, and Mr. Frassati's brother was Pietro. He liked Pietro. Mrs. Frassati was partial to the name George. Uh, I read in one of the books because Pier Giorgio had survived this difficult birth and was a fighter along the lines of St. George. So they made this combination name. And Pierre is not a standalone Italian name. You see Pier Luigi, Pier Francesco, Pier Alfredo, Pier Giorgio. And if you ever shorten his name, you shorten it to the Giorgio part. Nobody would ever call him Pierre, so that's like my threshold test when somebody contacts me. If they call, contact me about Blessed Pierre, then I know that they haven't really learned too much about him. But it's a simple, honest mistake, because in America, we would see Pierre Giorgio Frassati and naturally think Pierre is his first name and Giorgio is his middle name. His middle name was actually Michelangelo. So uh, Pier Giorgio is really like a first name, Michelangelo second, Frassati third, and it's a big Italian mouthful, right? Pier Giorgio, Michelangelo, Frassati. Uh, for short, Giorgio. Pier Giorgio's mother, Adelaide, Adelaide, Adelaide was an avid painter well known in the region Pier Giorgio was from. His father, Alfredo, was the founding, founder of the morning paper La Stampa. So keep in mind that at that time, the newspaper was the source of your news. There was La Stampa, which means the press, the morning paper, and then there was the evening paper, Le Corriere della Sera. So this was a big thing to be the owner, founder of a newspaper. And Mr. Frassati was very influential in the world of journalism, and later he became appointed as a senator for the Kingdom of Italy. It was a kingdom at the time. So he becomes a senator, and then he becomes ambassador to Germany. So Pier Giorgio is exposed to a life of the powerful, influential world of politics and business and so on. 
Now, Mr. and Mrs. Frasati didn't walk around the house in these clothes and the fur and the pearls in the ambassador outfit, but I think it just helps us to get an idea of the lifestyle that Pierre Giorgio was exposed to. What they didn't have in the family was a lot of spirituality. You'll read that Mr. Frasati was an atheist, which I don't think is really accurate. Sometimes it'll say agnostic. But what Mr. Frasati really was, I think, that we can relate to is a fallen away uh, Catholic, more or less. I mean, I have a lot of relatives who don't go to church anymore. I think that's more of the category of Mr. Frasati. Um, he wasn't against the church by any, any stretch of the imagination. Mrs. Frasati, on the other hand, I think we could call her like a good Sunday Catholic. She made sure the kids went to church, she went to church. There was no family praying together, no family prayers at meals, no rosary or anything like that because Mr. Frasati was not somebody who participated in the spiritual activities. Pierre Giorgio then had one younger sister, Luciana. They were 16 months apart and they were raised like twins, Luciana said. And you can see in this pic these pictures they practically look like twins. Mrs. Frasati, I think, wanted to have them close together in everything because she had lost that other child, remember, and she thought that if they were together, they could look after each other. So they were put together in the same grade in school. They went through everything together. They made their first Holy Communion together, confirmation together, and so on. Uh, Luciana says they were raised like twins and they were close, very close their entire lives. This is the house where the family lived. It's a bank. I took this picture. It's a bank. You can see the name of the bank on the screen here. Um, and you can go to, if you go to Turin, you can see this house from, from the outside because it's a bank. There's nothing in there of Pier Giorgio. On the side wall over by the door on the side, there's a plaque that will tell you that this is where Pier Giorgio Frassati, he died here at this house. So when we talk about that, um, this is the house I'm referring to. So from about the time he was 12, 13 on, the family lived here. And then when they wanted to get away from the city, the smoke, the, the traffic, the noise of Turin, they went to their summer home. And this was their summer home. Uh, and this is the home where I've spent all of my time immersing in the life of Pier Giorgio. So it's still a family home. It's not a museum. But if you go there tomorrow and ring the bell, they'll let you go in and take a look at the things belonging to Pier Giorgio there, which is very generous, I think, of the family. When I've been there in the summer, there will be hundreds of, of people coming through on a regular basis. Uh, a lot of times, large groups from France and different European countries will come through because they want to visit the rooms of Pier Giorgio Frassati here. So um, it's a very special place. It's in Polone. It's like a village. It's about 50 miles from Turin, um, 80 kilometers distance. And it's up at the base of the mountains. There's really not much there, um, but this is well worth it to go out of your way to get to this home. So here we go back to the family life looking a little bit more normal, Mr. and Mrs. Frasati and the two children. So keeping in mind that it wasn't, it looks like a nice, uh, happy family in, in a sense, but the Frasatis did not have the best marriage. Mr. and Mrs. Frasati had a, uh, not the best marriage. There wasn't a lot of spirituality. And where Pietro Giorgio got some of that influence was from his grandmother, Linda. This is Pietro Giorgio's mother's mother. And I like this picture in particular because the two of them being there together, very sweet of Pier Giorgio with his grandmother. But for me, it's almost a little bit prophetic because they would, in the end, die three days apart, something that you would never think of when you see that picture, that these two would be so connected in death as they were here in life. Linda, Pier Giorgio's grandmother, was one of the ones who taught him a little bit more in terms of prayer. One of the things she emphasized to him was to remember the holy souls in purgatory. Again, very nice that I'm here following the Feast of um, the Holy Souls, All Souls Day, because that was a very special devotion for Pier Giorgio. And if he climbed a mountain, he would pray for those who lost their lives on the mountain. If it was an anniversary of somebody who died, he would offer mass. In fact, that's one thing about his father. Mr. Frassati would go to the grave uh, on the anniversary of his own father's death. Like he had... A lot of people want to write him off in terms of spirituality, and it's not true. So, um, But anyway, Pier Giorgio learned about mostly praying for the dead, particularly from his grandmother, and he often prayed the De Profundus, the psalm more connected with praying for the souls in purgatory. Pier Giorgio was a great athlete. 
Uh, he lived there in Turin, so he was exposed. He had a lot of opportunities for sports. He liked to climb mountains. He liked to hike. Uh, he would carry his backpack and collect rocks and minerals. He had a big collection. He rode his bike the distance between those two homes, 50 miles on his bike between Polone and Torino. Um, he would ride horses. I mean, this was not so common, I think, back in that time for people to have vehicles, although the family had a nice family car. This horse was his father's horse, particularly known to be difficult to ride. But Piero Giorgio, when he would ride the horse, he would stop in town in front of any church. There were about four little churches in that tiny village, Polone. And he would always stop to make the sign of the cross in reverence of the Blessed Sacrament. And the horse was seen to look as if it were genuflecting. Many, many people wrote testimonies about how the horse was so well trained by him, and yet it was a difficult horse to ride. The family had a lot of pets, and many of them they gave names based on operas by Richard Wagner, and this horse was named Parsifal. Pier Giorgio um, is often associated with the outdoors, and rightly so, but one of the things people don't I mean, the mountains, but one of the things people don't think of him so much for is the beach. But he loved the beach. Uh, a photo not often seen is here, Piero Giorgio at the beach. Wouldn't that be a great holy card? Um, so Piero Giorgio would write letters about how his suntan was coming along and things like that, how many times he's been to the sea. He sailed, he, he rode, canoe, canoeing, and all kinds of uh, water sports. He loved the beach. And there he is on one of his ski teams, and you can see the beautiful mountains in the background. So if you've ever traveled in, in Italy up there, northern Italy, going from Polone or Milan to Torino, all the way, that beautiful mountain range. And the Winter Olympics were there not so long ago, in fact. So Piero Giorgio was often skiing in the mountains, but his primary activity would have been mountain climbing. Um, this picture here is from the very last time he climbed a mountain not knowing it would be the last time. And it was one month before he died. This was June 7th, 1925. He was climbing Le Lunelle, and he uh, would always, they, he was uh, big with photography, that, thankfully for us, because we have so many wonderful pictures. And he would collect them, pictures, and put them in nice photo albums, and he would caption them on the back. So on the back of this photo, he wrote these words, verso l'alto. Um, which I like to say to the top, some people will say to the heights, and so on. Verso l'alto, he wrote on the back of this, and some people will say that this was Piero Giorgio's motto. I've never seen it connected with him ever other than on the back of this picture. I don't believe he was walking around saying, hey, verso l'alto, you know. Um, but that's our motto for Saudi USA, for sure. It's, it's the motto of my organization, and I think for each of us that we're going verso l'alto, hopefully to the top, to be with Christ in heaven someday. So this is uh, the picture of his last climb. This also is his handwriting here. In Pierre Giorgio's handwriting, he wrote, mountains, 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 I love you. And he put that on his study door. And this strikes me because we could overlook it as something silly, but what do you love that much that you would write that out and put it on your door? Humanities Forum, Humanities Forum, Humanities Forum. <laughs> I love you. I mean, what would you put? What do you love that much? That really shows, in my opinion, the passion that he had for the mountains. He said, if my studies allowed me, I would spend entire days in the mountains, contemplating in that pure air the greatness of the Creator. So he really felt close to God there in the mountains. In fact, from his bedroom window in Polone, the summer home, when he looked out, I took these pictures from his, from his bedroom in the summer home. He looked out to the peak of Mount Mucrone, uh, a mountain that even his mother, she doesn't look at in that impressive fur and pearls picture, but she took Pietro Giorgio on one of his very first climbs, 10,000 feet up into a mountain. So the whole family liked to climb the mountain. And he would look from his bedroom window up at the mountain. And at the top of that little peak, the highest peak on the top, is this cross. This cross was dedicated in 1920, and Piero Giorgio was there at the dedication. And if you climb up to the top of that mountain, and there's a little bit more, you have to go an extra 20, 30 minutes to get to the cross. It has solar panels on it. And so from his bedroom window, at night, on a clear night, you could actually look out of his window and see the cross high up there on the mountain. Uh, so the mountains beckoned to Piero Giorgio. So back to his school life. So he and his sister were put in the same grade to 
as I said, to kind of be a protection for each other. They sat in the same desk, you know, the two chairs at the desk there. Peter Giorgio could be the patron saint for homeschoolers because they were tutored for the first few years of their education. He could be the patron saint for public school people because they were put into the state-run schools. He could be the patron saint for Catholic school students because Pier Giorgio actually went to Catholic school for two years. And, the, and here's why, because in 1913, when he was 12 years old, tragedy struck Pier Giorgio for the first time. And he wrote this letter about it, Dear Papa, I am confused and miserable, and I don't even know how to write to you. I saw how upset Mama was, and I don't know how to ask for a word of forgiveness. I am also sorry that I have to stay behind, and I am ashamed in front of my classmates and my sister who have gone ahead of me. This picture has nothing to do with that letter, but look how sad his sister looks, almost as like as if she knows his heartache here. This is Piero Giorgio and his sister with their father in his newspaper office. What was the tragedy for Piero Giorgio? He failed Latin. He failed Latin, and because he failed, he would not be able to go on to the next grade. So they would have to either hold him back, or there was a way out. And the way out was they put him in the school run by the Jesuit fathers. And then he would go on to the next grade there, make up the work that he missed, and if he did all of that successfully, then he could rejoin his sister and her classmates in the regular grade that he would have been in. And that's what he did. So at 12 years old, because he failed Latin, he went to the Jesuit-run school. And there, great things happened for him spiritually. He was invited by the headmaster to begin going to daily mass and communion. But he had to have his mother's permission, and she said no. A lot of times people think she said no, somehow she was against the church. Mrs. Frasati said no at first because she thought if he went to mass and communion every day at 12 years old, it would be so common to him it would be meaningless. And you have to keep in mind that at that time, nobody was going to mass and communion every day because it wasn't even really acceptable. In Pierre Giorgio's lifetime, Pope Pius X issued a decree encouraging people to go to daily mass, and that's when he lowered the age of First Holy Communion to the age of reason. So Pierre Giorgio was not even able to receive communion at age seven or eight because it wasn't uh, permissible in the church at the time. Now he's 12, and they see something special in him, perhaps. But his mother says no. A few days later, he, grows, he, he runs into the uh, office of the headmaster, and he says, o vinto, o vinto, in Italian. It says, I won. I won, father. And the father plays, the, Father Lombardi plays a little bit dumb. He says, what did you win, Pier Giorgio, the lottery or something, you know? He says, I won permission from my mother to go to Mass and Communion every day. This was the greatest thing in Pier Giorgio's life at 12 years old. Is it the greatest thing in our life today? At 12 years old, this was the greatest thing in his life, the greatest desire of his heart. And from that moment on, he never missed that daily appointment with the Lord. Something, I think, to challenge us on how devoted are we to fulfilling that obligation? Do we just see it as an obligation? With the Jesuit fathers, Pier Giorgio, again, he was encouraged praying the daily rosary. In fact, he would grow these Job's Tears seeds in the garden and have the nuns nearby make these rosaries, and he gave them as gifts to his friends. He was introduced to adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. Actually, Pier Giorgio went through that same thing a few years later. He failed again at 17, went back to the Jesuit Fathers for another year, and that's when he started with the nocturnal adoration for the student societies. Later, he became a third order Dominican, which is probably why I'm here today, because of the Dominican connection. Pier Giorgio actually would have, cel we celebrated this year the 100th anniversary of his profession of fi uh, final vows as a lay Dominican. Um, and in Pier Giorgio's style, rather than take the name of, he could take a name as, of a Dominican saint, he, instead of taking like Dominic or somebody easy, he took the name of this controversial reformer, Girolamo Savonarola, which if you don't know who he was, you can look him up and find out. This was a controversial pick. He even encouraged one of his uh, friends to join and, and follow in his footsteps with this controversy. Savonarola was beheaded and burned at the stake. And if you've been to Florence, there's a circle in the Piazza Signorina there, which marks the spot where he was killed and often considered a heretic. He's been, his reputation has been redeemed quite a bit since then. 
But Pier Giorgio was attracted to the zealous defenders of the faith, and so he was attracted to Girolamo Savonarola. That picture was from his confirmation, by the way. He had that armband on his sleeve from his confirmation. We live in a time where 75% of Catholics no longer believe in the real presence. These are some of the things said about Pier Giorgio in terms of his love for the Eucharist. He spoke about our Lord and the Eucharist with indescribable enthusiasm. He wouldn't miss communion for anything. He had absolutely no concern what others thought. Even at the Jesuit school when other kids were hanging around outside, he would go in the building and go straight to the chapel for, for morning mass. Although he was limping with a dislocated knee and using a crutch for a few days, he dragged himself to receive communion. Whereas we can find the, the slightest excuse or physical discomfort for a reason not to go. He was always on time for church, no matter how early in the morning. And in those days, it was early, because they had very strict fast rules. You fasted from midnight until you received communion. So masses, even weddings, were held at 6 in the morning sometimes. So no matter how early it was, no matter what the weather, he was on time. He often served mass twice a day. Many times, he was the only one at church responding to prayers at funerals. He would look up and gaze at the host as if he were speaking to Jesus. Peter Giorgio had a deep a relationship with the Lord. His parents, if they allowed him to go and his studies permitted, he went to adoration all the time. They tried to stop him from going. Mrs. Frasati, they would put out these flyers and announce there's going to be all night adoration and she would hide them only because she didn't want him to be out all night. They were concerned about his health. But he found ways to go. He felt that it was his way of um, being even closer to the Lord. So this is Pier Giorgio's college ID in his own handwriting when he was finally through all of those trials of failing and gets through high school. He now goes on to college. He takes um, a difficult subject rather than just phoning it in because his dad's so important and influential. He could have had any easy career, any job. But he wanted to major in mining engineering. He, he enrolled at the Royal Polytechnic University of Turin. And he said he, studied, he wanted to study mining engineering to serve Christ better among the miners. This also is something I like to think about because remember, this is a guy who wanted to spend entire days in the mountains contemplating the greatness of the Creator. He loved the mountains, but he was prepared to work below the earth in the mines because that is where the poorest of the poor were working in those jobs at the time. My, my Slovak grandfather was a coal miner when they came to America. And I've heard how terrible the conditions were for those men here in America around, around this time frame almost, I would say. So it means a lot to me to know that Pier Giorgio had a heart for those people in those conditions. This is his grade sheet. If you have bad grades, don't worry, you can be a saint. Um, Pierre Giorgio wrote this out one week before he died. At the very top line, it says June 27, 1925. And this was the state of his exams. So you can see a lot of 60s, 65, 70s, not a whole lot of 90s. I don't see a single 100. He wrote out what he had to do to finish his degree. He had 21 and 22 there were blank. And he died two exams short of finishing his college degree. However, on the 100th anniversary of his birthday in 2001, they gave it to him. The Royal Polytechnic Institute of Turin awarded him that degree posthumously. So uh, he took his student career seriously. At this time, he was already six years in college. His younger sister, Luciana, had finished her degree. Remember, they were in school at the same grade at the same time. She had finished a couple years earlier. And his father would say, if you continue in this path, you're going to you know, just be a blockhead and amount to nothing. They thought it would have been better if his sister had been the boy in the family because she had the ambition and the drive. Why was he taking six years to complete his college degree? There was a reason. Uh, in any case, we'll talk about it later. Mr. Frasati had no intention of his son working as a mining engineer in the mines. Mr. Frasati had intended for his son to work in the family business at the newspaper. And when Pier Giorgio was getting close to completing his degree that year, rather than speak to him directly, Mr. Frasati had a manager of the newspaper speak to him. And he said, you know, Pier Giorgio, your father has the desk ready. He expects you to work at the paper. You know, that's what he's thinking. And the man said that Pier Giorgio asked him, will this make my father happy? 
And he, with tears in his eyes, said, if it will make him happy, then tell him I accept. So he loved the mountains, but was going to work in the mines, and now is accepting a desk job. Would he have worked at the paper long? In my opinion, I don't think that would have lasted too long, and I think his father would have maybe uh, relented and, and yielded to his other desires, perhaps. But we'll never know because he died before any of that happened. And that brings us to more of talking about his spirituality. One of the most famous quotes of Piero Giorgio is from a letter he wrote to a friend, and he said, to live without a faith, without a patrimony to defend, without a steady struggle for the truth is not living but existing. And we should never just exist, but live. And that, I think, is something we have to ask ourselves. Are we checking the boxes? Are we just filling in the blanks? You know, this is what we have to do. This is getting through life. We're just getting by. We're just passing time. Or are we living? Because Piero Giorgio, in his short life, took advantage of every minute to really live. He gave a speech, and I think he summed up the, the reasons, the spirituality, the way that he would live his life to the fullest. St. Therese of Lisieux is known for her little way, and Piero Giorgio, I think, could be known by these three things. He gave a speech in which he talked about the three apostolates, good example, persuasion, and charity. So if you're capable of good example, persuasion, and charity, you can be a saint with bad grades and everything, right? So there's so much hope. That's why I, I love the story of Blessed Pier Giorgio. Good example, one of the main things he stressed was that we should be happy. His sister wrote him a letter uh, once. There was a very tra a sad event in his life, and he wrote, she wrote to see how he was, and he wrote her back, and he said, you ask me if I'm happy? How could I not be happy? As long as my faith gives me strength, I will always be happy. But his definition of happiness was this. True happiness does not consist in the pleasures of this world or in earthly things, but in peace of conscience, which we only have if we are pure of heart and mind. And he believed that good example was something that we did 24-7, that our whole lives had to be guided by Christian moral law. His sister said that in those days, to participate in a pr religious procession was a sign of courage. It was an anti-Catholic, anti-cleric time, you know, almost like our post-Christian society that we're getting to right now. And he would risk being punched or even worse, being arrested. But Pierre Giorgio was always out there. If there was a procession going on, he was there. Um, this was the entrance of this new archbishop into the city, and they have the Blessed Sacrament and this big procession. So Pierre Giorgio is there often kind of on the outside to keep the peace. If there was trouble, he was there. And he was arrested on occasion. Uh, one time that was famous was in Rome. There was a big 10,000 young men in this anniversary march for Catholic youth, supposed to be very peaceful. And instead, the royal guard was ordered to break up the procession. It turned violent. Piero Giorgio was trying to keep the flag. Um, he had it in his teeth, in fact. They were arrested. He was thrown into the jail, which was more like a holding area for the most part. Uh, he never used his name for privilege, but when they were taking down the names of everyone they arrested, they would say, your name. And so they come to him, and they say, your name. He says, uh, Frasati, uh, Pier Giorgio, son of. They ask him, son of. He says, Alfredo uh, Frasati, your father's a a occupation, ambassador to Germany. And they say, you, you know, you can go, because they realize they've got this influential guy here. But he wouldn't go. He stayed right there. He led those others in prayer. They prayed the rosary. And the next day, they went back out on the street. They tied the flag to a pole with a sign that was kind of mocking the government. You know, this was the flag that was, um, you know, torn apart by the government. And they went back out. Pierre Giorgio said, it's not those who suffer violence who should fear but those who practice it. And when God is with us, we should not be afraid. He was put to another test. When he was at home having lunch with his mother, his father was away. The maid had opened the door, and a group of fascists stormed in to destroy, vandalize the family home. Pier Giorgio heard her scream. He got up from the table. He went over and with his fists beat them off. It says in this article that the young son disarmed one of the attackers, one of the assailants, and he chased them out of the house, screaming at them, calling them names all the way, Piero Giorgio. 
Uh, and later they were all arrested, but this was a famous incident. And you can see this is in English. It was in the London Times. In fact, Pierre Giorgio's sister was in London, and she read about this happening at her home in the paper. And then she immediately went to uh, send a telegram to say, tell me what's happened here, because that's how she learned of it. She said, I, would, I figured everything was OK, or you would have notified me sooner. This brought uh, Pierre Giorgio quite a bit of, a lot of telegrams poured in commending him for his behavior. So being a Catholic and good example is not just being a doormat. Um, it's a, he was a strong, manly man who was prepared to defend the faith, defend his family, defend his country. Pierre Giorgio on the apostolate of persuasion, he felt that persuasion was one of the most beautiful and necessary things we can do. And he said, young people, approach your friends who live their lives away from the church and who don't spend their free time in healthy pastimes, but in vices. Convince those unfortunate people to follow the ways of God, which he said is not always strewn with roses. A lot of times it's thorns when we follow God, but it was the happier way to go. Pierre Giorgio wasn't a heavy-handed kind of guy. He wasn't like persuading you by saying, go to church or you're going to hell. Um, he would persuade them by, they would, he would play a game of pool. And if he won, then they would have to go to church. Like the wager would be, if I win, you go to church with me, or you go to mass, or you go to uh, pray the rosary or something like that. So he would arrange a trip in the mountain and maybe invite a priest to be there so they could go to confession or things like that. He had you know, nice, creative ways, gentle ways, I think, to persuade his friends to follow the ways of God. They said he made religion look interesting and attractive by the way he practiced it. And that's really important, I think, for us because example and the way we present things, you know, it matters. Pierre Giorgio founded a group um, called the Tipilowski. And it doesn't translate too well into English. It, you'll see it in books like The Shady Characters or The Sinister Ones or like The Swindlers and Swindlerettes. It was a practical joke. Everything about this was really a practical joke. He wrote up, typed up a, a charter for this group. And the motto was, few but good like macaroni. <laughs> and he had a fake name of a saint for their patron. And the silly things about the rules of the meeting were like, don't bring dogs and things like that. Sometimes people contact me because they want the rules for the group. And I'm like, that's, it was, you know, it's all, if you read it in Italian, it was all kind of a joke. But underlying the joke was a real sincere thing. Pier Giorgio's friends were starting to get married. They were taking on jobs. They were moving away and getting separated. And he wanted a way for them to stay connected. And so he said, I would like for us to pledge a pact that knows no earthly limits or temporal boundaries, union and prayer. So they went on mountain climbs. They did a lot of trips and things like that. But the real thing for him was that they be connected. Because his family didn't have, his parents had a difficult marriage. And for Pierre Giorgio, he said, after parents and sisters, one of the most beautiful affections is that of friendship. And every day, I ought to thank God, because he has given me men and lady friends of such goodness who formed for me a precious guide for my whole life. His friends were very important to Pierre Giorgio. That was his outlet. It, you know, the home life was stressful, but um, he was happy with his friends. He fell in love, we say, with one of the girls in that group, the close friends, the Tipilowski. And a lot of times we don't hear love stories about saints, but uh, it's another refreshing thing about Pierre Giorgio, the humanness of him. Now, he never pursued this relationship, although you'll read different accounts of this. Um, the girl that he was interested in, her name was Laura, Laura Hidalgo, and she was a few years older than him. Her parents had died, and she had a younger brother. They were basically taking care of themselves. She was not in the same social sphere as the Frasades at all. But um, Pier Giorgio didn't not date her because some people will say his mother or dad forbid it, and that wasn't true. Um, Pier Giorgio had a hard time with this decision, and he wrote a letter to his friend, and he said, I'm reading Angeloni's romance novel. I loved that way, and believe me, I am moved because it seems like my own love story. I, too, loved that way. I like this letter because once uh, Pier Giorgio's father went to talk to the priest because Pier Giorgio would fall asleep kneeling at his bed praying the rosary. And his father goes to the priest and says, could you tell my son not to spend so much time on his knees praying because he's falling asleep there on, at the bed? And the priest says to him, would you rather he be reading some romance novel? 
So I like this letter because Pier Giorgio starts out by saying, I'm reading Angeloni's romance novel. I too loved that way. Only in the novel, it is the woman who makes the sacrifice, whereas in my case, I will be sacrificed. But if that is how God wants it, his holy will be done. Pier Giorgio decided on his own not to pursue a relationship with Laura. So there was a thing called courtship in those days, right? Um, so he, he decided not to court Laura. And the reason was his parents' marriage was on the verge of separation, and he said, what sense would it make to build a new relationship on the ruins of another? He knew this would have caused a lot of stress in the family and would have been the straw that broke the camel's back. So it was his decision not to pursue that relationship. And lastly, the apostolate of charity. Pierre Giorgio is probably most known for this. He said, what would life be without acts of charity? He wrote this out in his handwriting. His sister said he carried this with him his whole life, I mean his adult life. He wrote this out. You know what it is. It's the first letter of St. Paul to Corinthians, chapters 1 to 13. If I speak with the tongues of angels but do not have love, I'm a clanging symbol. If I give my body to be burned but do not have love, I'm nothing. In the end, three things remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these he has underlined is love. Um, that compelled Pierre Giorgio. When he was 17 years old, he joined the St. Vincent de Paul Society. I saw driving in today, the very first thing, when I, the way we came in, was a drop-off for St. Vincent de Paul. So very much uh, would have made Pierre Giorgio feel at home driving in through that, that entrance. He would ask his friends to go with him on some of these cases. He would go into the worst places where there were terrible diseases like leprosy, uh, into the slums. A friend asked him how could he stand the smell. He said, don't ever forget that even though the house is sordid, you are approaching Christ. Around the sick, the poor, and the unfortunate, I see a light that we do not have. Pierre Giorgio wasn't about just handing off cash. He would go into the homes, brush the children's hair, play with them, be hands-on find jobs for men coming out of prison, spend time with them. His friends would say, can't we bring the family car? Why do we have to go you know, on foot? And he'd say, you don't approach a poor person driving up in a nice fancy car. He respected the dignity of them. So charity for Pierre Giorgio was giving of himself in many ways. And I think this is a pivotal quote of his, especially in the times we live in. He said, what wealth it is to be in good health as we are but we have the duty of putting our health at the service of those who do not have it. To act otherwise would be to betray that gift of God. So he was willing to risk it all because he had the gift of health. And he did risk it all and he did pay the price for it. So on one of those visits to the poor, and we don't know where or when, he contracted the virus of polio. And within one week, Pier Giorgio died. There's a beautiful book by his sister. It's called Pier Giorgio, for my brother Pier Giorgio, His Last Days. It's a short book, and it's just about the last week of his life. Um, and the reason why we have that book, in fact, is because his sister, who had already married, came home because his grandmother, who you saw the picture of, was dying of just old age. And there was a lot of activity and commotion. His grandmother died in that big house, the one in Torino that's a bank that I showed you. While all the focus was on his grandmother, Pierre Giorgio's body was slowly being overcome by the virus of polio, which caused a paralysis. So he would drag himself down the hall to go to pray at his grandmother's bedside. He would fall down. He didn't want anybody to know. Um, he was slowly but surely losing the use of his legs and his limbs. And he, um, his mother says, at a time when I need you the most, you're basically good for nothing. Like, there was really no attention on, on what was going on with him. He threw up, he was sweating feverishly and all of that. And the family was focused on the grandmother. So uh, Mrs. Frasati dies, I mean, Mrs. Frasati's mother, Linda, dies on July 1st. She dies on July 1st, and they have the funeral two days later. And after the funeral mass, they take her body, those 50 miles, to that other home where they have a big family crypt in the cemetery there. And at the last minute, Pierre Giorgio's mother decides not to go. She's worn out from all of that with her mother dying. And she stays home, and she goes to check on Pierre Giorgio, who's home in bed. He can't go. And she gets close to him, and he says, don't, don't come by me because you'll get what I have. And she says, don't be silly. Mothers don't get their children's illnesses. But then she realized how sick he was. They got the doctor, this is July 3rd, 
It's a Friday. They discover that he's very sick. In fact, he has polio. He can't move his limbs. The doctor's telling him to get up. He can't. Um, they diagnose this, and Mrs. Frasati calls the family at that other home. She lets somebody know that they need to come back, but she doesn't say it's about Pierre Giorgio. They think it's maybe his father's business. His father takes the train back. His sister comes later in a car. When they get there, they find Pierre Giorgio near death. He had said, the day of my death will be the most beautiful day of my life. Nobody expected it to be that soon. Um, this is the bedroom where Pierre Giorgio died, although this room is now in that mountain summer home. But it was in that home that's the bank now, but they moved it to that other room. So if you go to Polone up in the mountains, you can pray at the bed where Pierre Giorgio died. Um, and so he died there on July 4th. July 4th is his feast day. Another thing that I love about him, because we always have fireworks to celebrate Pierre Giorgio's feast day, right? Uh, well, I guess there's another reason, but I like the reason. I like to think it's to celebrate his feast day. As he was dying, he was still thinking about the poor. He asked his sister to go and get him some things that he had in his jacket in his study. He had some medications for a poor person that he was helping, and he insisted on writing the instructions. And who could read this, right? But he wrote this out in his handwriting there as he's dying. And it says, these are the injections, it's medicine, for Converso and a pawn ticket belonging to Sapa. Renew it on my account. He had, somebody had pawned their wedding ring, and he was paying so that it wouldn't get sold. And so he, it was Friday, July 3rd, and he wants this note to go to St. Vincent de Paul because they always met on Friday. And so he writes that note. He dies, and a big thing happens. This is when thousands of people pour out into the streets because now they realized um, the guy that was helping them, who never said he was from this famous influential family, was from a famous influential family. That humble guy was Pier Giorgio Frassati, son of this family. And his family is wondering, how do these people know about Pier Giorgio? It was like a stunning double awakening moment. Um, his coffin is under the yellow arrow there, and that house in the background is the big house that's now a bank, only black and white. It's a hard, little bit harder to notice. So thousands of people come out into the streets. They had to close streets and make the funeral procession even longer. Nobody expected this, and his father said to his mother, we did not know our son. The canonization process pretty much began there because there was such an outpouring of people. They knew there was something extra special. And the process goes forward. It hits a few snags. But at the end of the things moving forward, in 1981, they um, opened the coffin of Pierre Giorgio. They do this because it's part of the canonization process. They submitted all the paperwork. And they open the coffin to see if they're going to find any relics that they could use for that future saint. So they had a crew from the Vatican there. Um, they were prepared to spend a week documenting little bone fragments and things like that, right? And the family was there, Pierre Giorgio's sister and some of his nieces and uh, other family members. And when they opened the coffin and they had a little white you know, shroud over him, they saw you know, that little tuft of his hair there. And they were like, whoa, we have something here. And they pulled it back. And uh, I asked one of his nieces once, when did you realize there was something special about your uncle? Because he died before any of them were born, right? And she said, to me, there were two things. One, I'm a doubting Thomas, and for me, Seeing is believing. And she was there when this happened. And she said, Christine, he was perfect. His skin, his face, almost a smile on his lips. So that, that was what it took for her to really believe there was something special. And the second thing, she said, is when the pope comes to your house. So uh, Pope John Paul II was taking one of his summer vacations up in the mountains. And this, this is a mountain village, OK? And he had a devotion to Pier Giorgio because when he was a young man, he was influenced by Pier Giorgio Frassati. And so he went to pray at the tomb of Pier Giorgio. Down, it's in a crypt down, down below. You go down there. And um, he was praying there for like 20, 25 minutes. And the family was up above. And he was down there by himself all that time. They knew that the pope visiting meant something. He went up after, and he prayed with them. And that's Pier Giorgio's sister there. Uh, in 1989, she would have been 87 years old. And the following year, Pier Giorgio was beatified by Pope John Paul II. So it was almost like a sign something was coming when the pope came there. 
I want to just show you, because I think it's very special, a very short clip of the beatification moment when the Pope gives the, says the magic words. But I want you to notice one thing. Uh, Pier Giorgio was known by, uh, called by this Pope the man of the beatitudes, man of the eight beatitudes. And he's famous for this mountain climbing gear and the pipe in his mouth. I get a lot of, sometimes people don't like that, that I show a picture of a guy who smoked stinky cigars or you smoked a pipe. But this is who he was, okay? Well, it wasn't a popular thing for the church to have an image. You can see on the facade of St. Peter's there, there's the banner of Pier Giorgio. This was very special that they beatified him by himself because a lot of times they'll do five, six, seven. In fact, the church just canonized 10 a few months ago, all at once. So Pier Giorgio was beatified by himself. You see the original photo here. Now in this video, you'll see that there's something different when you see the, uh, the video. And I hope this works. This is a, a video clip, if it'll play. Idest quarta iuri in locis ad modis jure statutis quotannis celebrari possit in nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sanctus. Luciana Frassati there, she would have been, this is 1990, so she was um, 80, oh, 88. She had, well, she was 80, almost 88, so she would be 88 in August. So it's a beautiful thing for her after all of her hard work. The great books about Pietro Giorgio are written by his sister. Um, I don't put my book in her category at all. And she was be able, able to be there to, to see him beatified. Now what they did was, this is before computers and Photoshopping and all of that, so they literally just chopped off the head with the pipe. And that head that's on that body was from Pier Giorgio when he was 16 in that very first slide that I showed you, the young Pier Giorgio head. <laughs> so that's how it was done. Pope uh, John Paul II at the beatification said he left this world rather young, but he made a mark upon our entire century. And not only on our century, and that was prophetic because in this century, Pier Giorgio's body was taken out when it was found to be perfectly incorrupt. They made a brand new coffin, and they took his body to Krakow, Poland, for World Youth Day, if anybody was there. They took his body to Sydney, Australia, for World Youth Day. Um, his body, perfectly incorrupt, is not on display and never has been on display. Um, it's in that coffin. It lies in state. It lies in, a, in an altar in the cathedral in Turin, where the Holy Shroud is. And if you've ever been there and walked to see the shroud, you've walked right past him, and you might not even have known it. He's the only saint in the cathedral in Turin where the shroud is. So another thing, Pope John Paul, I'm winding down with Pope John Paul II's quotes because they're so good. He said, certainly at a superficial glance, Prasadi's lifestyle, that of a modern young man who was full of life, right, living and not existing, does not present anything out of the ordinary. And I think we've seen that. But Pope John Paul said, but that, this, however, is the originality of his virtue, which invites us to reflect upon it and impels us to imitate it. So that's really the message of Pier Giorgio. The life of this normal young man shows that we can be holy. Everyone in those, that second slide I showed can be holy. All of us here, we can be holy by living our friendships, studies, sports, and service to the poor in a constant relationship with God. That's all Pier Giorgio did. Good example, persuasion, charity, his love for the Eucharist and the Blessed Mother, the daily yes to God. That was the secret of Pier Giorgio's life. And this is a beautiful quote of his to, to end on John Paul's quotes. Prayer and contemplation, silence and reception of the sacraments, 
give tone and substance to his varied apostleships, and his life, enlivened by the Spirit of God, is transformed into a wonderful adventure, and that's what God wants for us, to live our lives, not exist, and, and see life as a wonderful adventure lived with Christ. For me, this quote strikes home because um, for me, no, getting to know Piero Giorgio has been a wonderful adventure. I left my professional career and I went off to Italy and I arrived two days before Luciana turned 104. So I was celebrated Piero Giorgio's sister's 104th birthday with ice cream cake at that family home up in the mountains. Um, and then the following year, I was there for pretty much the last month of her life. This is Luciana at 105. She died at 105. We just marked the 15th anniversary of her death. Uh, it's in the book. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's in the book. It's very special to me to have had that time with her. Um, so, you know, in this family of the Frasatis, keep this in mind, there was a baby who died at eight months. There was a son who died at 24. And there was a daughter who lived to be 105. We have no idea what our time is going to be. Just before coming here, I learned a very close friend has been told she has stage four cancer. She has six children and very short time to go. We have no idea. So we cannot put off holiness. And so I like to um, you know, make that your thing to think about holiness. Part of my big adventure is spending a lot of time in that family home. This is the bottom of half of the main staircase in that home, climbing Piero Giorgio's mountains. And this is the priest who introduced me to Piero Giorgio, so a high point for me was to have him come and say mass in the room where Piero Giorgio died. This is one of his nieces, uh, Giovanna. And of course, I had my book reviewed by the best reviewer of all, Piero Giorgio Frassati. Um, so life can be a great adventure. So I ask you, what is your plan for holiness? You plan out all your semester, all your classes, all your grades, all your obligations, your shopping list, everything. What is your holiness plan? I think in our minds we think that can wait. It's going to be an easy thing. We're just going to waltz right into heaven someday. God's plan for us is always a lot more challenging, a lot of ups and downs. We have to have a way to get through life. And that's why we have the saints like Pierre Giorgio. John Paul said, I would like to mention Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati. Get to know him. Pope Benedict, I, would like, I invite you to read his biography. Blessed Pierre Giorgio shows us that to be Christians means to love life, nature, and above all, our neighbor particularly those in difficulty. Pope Francis, the beautiful witness of Pier Giorgio Frassati, can help you. And mostly, um, I like the, this is one of my all-time favorite quotes of Pier Giorgio. As you go through life and all of its uncertainties, he said at one point, I'm not making plans for the future, you know, because who knows what's going to happen. But he said, the future is in the hands of God, and better than that, it could not be as long as we're in that relationship with the Lord in holiness. So I like to end with a prayer, and that's, that's what I want to do, but I know we save some time for questions and answers if anybody has any questions. Now's your chance. The world expert here. World expert. Um, if anybody has any particular questions. Thank you very and, much. And, and we're still going to do our pop quiz. No, still do I the pop forgot. quiz and the prayer afterwards. Yeah. Okay, so our custom is, thank you very much, our custom is to start with students' questions, um, and hopefully there are some. And all the students immediately look down, so I won't make <laughs> eye contact with them. Okay. <laughs> Let me start to get everyone thinking. So I'm really, oh, yeah. he's, he's, he's a student of life. That's my husband. OK. okay. <laughs> I guess I have to let him, I have to let him talk. <laughs> but that might encourage one of these shy undergraduates. Um, that was very nice. That was very nice. Um, often decisions of canonization are political. They have something to do with uh, an issue. And I don't mean political in the crash sense, but rather they, the, the, it's, the church is attempting to you know, point something out. Okay? I don't know if, we're, if that issue comes you know, with the beginning of the devotion to uh, Pier Giorgio or with the canonization. I suspect it was prior. 
Okay, so you, you he's located obviously in the in the twenties. Um, so yeah, can you say something about uh, you know the saints are political figures after all, and there was politics that, in that's Italy. That's something just to get me in trouble if I answer that question. The saints and political figures. I mean, the church just canonized two saints not too long ago who were for immigration. So I, I think I agree with that um, aspect of it. I think in Pierre Giorgio's case, his, I, I don't think there's a politicization of his beatification, if that's what you mean. But I do know that they, the church likes to have saints that speak to certain things that are happening in the culture. Well, and, I mean that he rises. Yeah, I mean, I would be purely speculating, but the Pope at the time of Pierre Giorgio's beatification was John Paul II, who had a deep admiration for Pierre Giorgio. And I think there was something significant, not just symbolic, about the fact that he was beatified by himself, also as if the Holy Father really wanted to make a statement because of his image of the laity, you know, because of his example as a strong lay Catholic. I mean, you mentioned Maria Goretti, but. The relatability of Pierre Giorgio, that's the number one thing I hear is how relatable he is, um, that he speaks to us at every level. You know, Pierre Giorgio is such an easy person to talk about because we have a divide in the church over social justice, Catholics, and the sacramental, you know, all of these things, but he was everything of that. So I think he's the embodiment of the laity, you know, what a really good lay Catholic should be. And I think when he was beatified in 1990, the, the Holy Father really, I think, loved him. And what we don't know, we haven't discussed, but there was a little problem in his canonization um, that unfolded. It was moving along full speed ahead, and then somebody made some accusations, and they just shoved it aside. And he was going to be off in um, obscurity, really. And then there was a series of events that happened, and one of the very last acts of Pope Paul VI was to reopen the cause of canonization of Pierre Giorgio. And John Paul II then, as the Holy Father, I think he really loved this manly image of Catholicism and the lay image of Catholicism. And right now, he's actually rising a little bit further. A lot of people focus on Blessed Carlo Acutis right now um, because he's contemporary, young, teenager, computer geek. I don't you know. They, I think they could call him something besides geek. but. Uh, the thing about Pierre Giorgio is he also had that Eucharistic life that Blessed Carlo had. And I think right now we have this new focus on the renewal of the Eucharist devotion and so on. And so we're seeing Pierre Giorgio take on right now, in fact, even more uh, prominence. And there's a lot of push of things that are happening in, uh, with his, his cause right now for that reason, I think. Because you're right, there is always something. Uh, I think the church is calling attention to something with the beatification or canonization. And I think in his case right now, where we have a crisis among the laity and in the church, that's his, uh, his real appeal. And I think we're going to, I know we're going to see more of him um, and more uses of him from the church. Yes. Did that inspire any of our students? Oh, I was just go, thinking go ahead, the Catherine. same thing. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think anybody did it. Did you go ahead? Oh, here. Here. Um, how we tend to like plan out a lot of aspects of our life, but um, our plan for holiness kind of falls to the wayside. Um, and then I feel like that connected to back to something you said earlier about um, how some of his grades weren't so great. Um, do you think his ability to kind of look beyond what was right in front of him, like his grades and stuff, and see his greater purpose on his path, um, do you think that helped him achieve such great holiness as he was able to do? Well, that's a great question. I think for Pierre Giorgio, one, one of the things I probably didn't clearly say, a lot of the problem with his grades was he was doing so much charity. So um, that was his priority. I mean, he was committed to the Eucharist. He was committed to the serving. 
The two commandments were pure Georgia's, to love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so that was his focus. And I don't think he placed a priority on, you know, whether, if he got a 60 and it was a passing grade, he was happy. If you read the book of his letters, you know, he'll say, well, I, you know, I got a 60 or whatever, but I passed. And he moved, he moved on. He wasn't like looking at his grades like I'm a total slacker and a loser and what, what's wrong with me. He, because his priority was he was out there in the street serving the poor. So I think because his priorities, he was detached. He's, he's known as the man of the Beatitudes. He was detached. He said, I, I am one of the poor. You know, He saw himself in that capacity. So his identity was not worldly success, but those higher goals. And so I don't, need, I don't know that he had to look beyond anything because he was already there in a sense. Like That was what mattered to him. So we can look at it and go, wow, that guy took six years, and what was he thinking, and, and all that. And he was berated and compared to his sister a lot, and it was very humbling to have been in that position. But I don't think it bothered him because that's who he was. And they say that nobody laughed at Pierre Giorgio because he was who he was 24-7. And what he saw himself as was, what he saw himself as was a child of God, your brother in Christ, and that was his priority. So, yeah, that's how he measured himself, and his plans were um, just to be with Christ and be happy and bring that to other people. I just want to say thank you so much. I just loved your talk. Great. I felt like it was fire. <laughs> it just sets a fire, and oh, my gosh. Um, I work at the Catholic school with the Dominican sisters, and I work with, the other day with just seventh graders, and so shows film. I show some films of saints and the seventh grader he's a little guy he said I just want to tell you I'm really mad right now I hate these films oh. they always show how good these people are and nobody can live up to it I am so frustrated and I looked at him and I said well I understand because I've had that experience too you know when I was growing up it's like oh you can never do this um, let's think about it so we met the following week and he continued on that same theme this is a great book. I mean, this is great stuff, and I hope you brought your books with you because I'm going to buy them all. <laughs> <laughs> Wish I'd have known you were going to buy them all. I would have brought them all. <laughs> now uh, you know. No, I definitely. Yeah, I just. It was. It's just amazing. It's and that amazing. kind of goes to the point of Dr. Keating there. That relatability of Peter Giorgio, I think, is another thing that the church wants to emphasize. We can do it. We can be holy. Right. Oh. Okay. Yes, I'm her husband. Yeah, that was great. Um, well, you know that you're at a Dominican college. Can you say anything more about his Dominican connections? He's a third-order Dominican. Catherine and I have like, looked into him a little bit, but we don't know much about that. Can you say anything? Like, you... uh, well, Pierre Giorgio, I think, I, well, uh, on the f website, the website is frasadausa.org, and I have... He was Vincentian because he was very committed to St. Vincent de Paul. When his family would go away for vacations, he would stay in Turin sometimes and say, because if I, if I leave, if everybody leaves, who will take care of the poor? And I think he was really Vincentian in that that was a driving force for him. Um, he was, there are a few things on there. Um, John Bosco was Salesian, and Pierre Giorgio was from Torino, where Don Bosco's beautiful shrine is, and he, the first postulator for Pierre Giorgio was Salesian. He was influenced by the Salesian fathers. But he was Dominican, and he, in the sense that he was, the Dominicans remember, um, even Pierre Giorgio's niece, who called me yesterday and asked, have I been to Providence, because there's a priest, there's a Providence a father, a Dominican father, Father Pierre Giorgio, who apparently doesn't go by Father Pierre Giorgio. I'll have to talk to you after, and she asked me, Father Nicador, she always says. Oh, he is. Okay. Well, she, I have a li an email from her because uh, his, Pierre Giorgio's niece just turned 95 last week, the one who does this work primarily out of all of his nieces and nephews and was very inter interested in my visit here to Providence. But she has told me, you know, they didn't have Bibles in the home even. They weren't even allowed to have the Old Testament because it was racy or scandalous or whatever. I don't know. And so the Dominican fathers with the preaching and teaching were very essential to the Catholic at the time for understanding and learning about the faith. And so he was deeply influenced, and Pierre Giorgio saw how the Dominicans were out there teaching and preaching the faith, and that was an, that was an appeal to him. And so I think he was, there were two priest brothers, the fathers Robati, 
Um, and so he was very influenced by them, and they would encourage becoming a lay Dominican. Now, um, there's a letter that Pierre Giorgio wrote where he encourages some of his friends to follow in his footsteps and to be lay Dominicans, and he says, you know, if it was hard, I wouldn't do it. I, it I kind of makes me chuckle. Um, like, as we're encouraged, you know, like, take, you know, St. Dominic says, we grow fat if we don't rant and rave, or whoever, who, who said that, Augustine or Dominic. So, um, but he was devoted. He prayed the divine office. He did the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary. When he received, when he had made his first vows, a nuance of Pier Giorgio is he made his first profession, and then like a month later, his final profession, which is not the normal thing, but his father had been appointed the ambassador to Germany. And so the family then was spending a lot of time at the embassy in Berlin. And because of the idea that Pierre Giorgio wouldn't be there, they allowed him to do that. Um, there's a beautiful testimony of the father who administered those vows of Pierre Giorgio and how he knelt there with tears streaming down his face, how much it meant to him. So it meant a great deal to him to become a lay Dominican. And I think that although he was influenced by a lot of religious communities there, he admired, I think, the hands-onness of those Dominican uh, friars who are out there preaching and teaching. There's a beautiful old Dominican church in Turin, San Domenico, of course, um, where he took his vows in the, in the small chapel there. It's just beautiful, rich tradition of the Dominicans there. So. Uh, hi. What important thing, in your opinion, do we not know about him? In other words, you know, you've been studying him for a long time, and there must be, are there things about him that you wish you knew that you don't, that, that would maybe give us greater insight into him as a person and as a saint? Uh, what do we not know about him that I wish you knew about him? Well, from my perspective, I wish that all of the books of his sister had been translated into English because they're not, and we really actually have, I think my book is like the number nine in English, um, which is pretty sad, uh, I think, about him. There are beautiful books written by his sister, a whole book about his charity. Just when he died, you know, for the canonization process begins, they collect testimonies from people. Have you seen Pierre Giorgio? Do you know anything about him? And there's an entire book just of his acts of charity that he did. There's an entire book about his faith, his spiritual practices, the way he lived out his faith. And so we kind of um, are reduced to knowing that he climbed mountains and smoked a pipe and did some charity. So I guess to answer that question, I don't know that there's secret things that I wish people knew about him, but I wish people knew the full extent of his spirituality. I think we're really at a, some, in some ways, it's still at a very introductory surface level of Pierre Giorgio. And I think, I think he's like the church, you know, where they'll say um, shallow enough for a mouse to swim in and deep enough for an elephant to wade in or something, more, I'm close, something like that, right? Um, and so I think that we know surface amounts, stereotypical types of things of Pierre Giorgio and an amazing amount of misinformation is out there about him for an inexplicable reason to me because there aren't that many English sources and most of them are true by his sister. Um, and so we have a lot of misinformation about the family, and I wish we didn't have that. But no, I think his life is there. I think it's available. If you speak Italian, you'll get it all, and I wish. Um, EWTN is producing right now a brand new docudrama being done by an Italian film company. They're already filming it. It will be released next year, and I hope that that will give us another richer, deeper look um, because we don't have films and we don't have enough books and things to learn even more about his spirituality. I'm going to allow one last question because we have a Dominican who has a question. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll break, and there will be a reception well, we'll afterwards. We'll have the prize. Okay. Have the prize. <laughs> we have a prize. Sorry to keep everyone hostage. But um, thank you so much for coming and, and sharing uh, your love of Pierre Giorgio with us and uh, some information. I, I didn't realize he beat off fascists. That's awesome. He you know? oh, I didn't yeah, realize oh, yeah. He, yeah, he beat off the, uh, the attackers. Um, I was wondering about his canonization process. Uh, maybe, I don't know, if you, maybe it was the fact he's incorrupt. Was that the miracle that led to his beatification? No, that's not a, could a lot you, of them are incorrupt, but that's not. Okay, could you speak to, uh, just to tell us, what was the miracle that led to his beatification? Sure, when he died, uh, as I said, a huge 
movement. I mean, Pier Giorgio was written. People started naming their children Pier Giorgio. My last time in Italy, I had dinner with a guy named Pier Giorgio, family friend, a, a friend of a family I'm friends with there. And it was such a surreal thing to be talking to a guy named Pier Giorgio, but this happened a lot as soon as he died. And um, they created some special relic cards, and the cause was just full speed ahead. And so there was a man named Domenico Salon. This was in the 1930s, just a, about eight years after he died. This miracle happened. Um, this man had lost his faith. He had Pott's disease, which is kind of, I understand, it to be spinal tuberculosis, so he was paralyzed. And they had a priest visit him. He brought a relic of Pier Giorgio, and the man had a spiritual conversion. He asked to have his, uh, hear his confession. He returned to the sacraments. And he had an immediate physical healing. And he actually served in the Italian army, I think, in World War II, Domenico Salon. But that miracle happened right away. Everything was going right away. And like I said, there was something that curtailed the cause. And then it was kind of shelved. And then it was reopened. So that miracle from the 1930s was then, in 1989, 87 or 89, uh, when he was declared venerable, and that was given, maybe it was 89, it's on the website, um, that he was given the, that miracle was finally officially approved then. So um, actually I've been re the recipient of many reports of incredible miracles to, um, due to the intercession of Pietro Giorgio, and some things are being investigated now, and um, he's def there are definitely miracles uh, happening through his intercession. They used that old one because it was there already at the time and had just been put aside. Okay, let me do these door prizes for the students sitting in the back and uh, who I know will be so smart and they'll get this. I just have a little prize here for you. I have a collector's edition tiny saint of Pierre Giorgio with a pipe in his mouth. And it's actually very easy to get this prize. Um, when I gave my presentation, I specifically pointed out things in Pierre Giorgio's handwriting, and there were six of them. So raise your hand if you can remember any of those things that were in his handwriting. Anybody remember anything that was in his handwriting? Mountains, 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 I love you. Okay, that's one. Anybody? Go ahead. Verso l'alto, he wrote. The last words that he wrote, his last note, that's three. Okay, I got your, your things down here. There were three more. I won't limit it to students if the students don't guess. Anybody is up for, up for grabs? There were three more. The first Corinthians, that was one. Yes, very good. So then there were two more things in his handwriting that Pierre Giorgio wrote. Don't leave the money on the table, as they say, right? You want to take advantage of these things. Oh, okay. His exam sheet, that's excellent, excellent. The last one is some, maybe hard, but it should be maybe almost the easiest one for you guys to get. That was a clue. Anybody? No, no, it's in his own handwriting, something in his own handwriting. All right, well, I don't know. I have to let this, I'll have to take this one back. You're going to hate it when I tell you. Anybody have one last guess? Uh, no, but I wasn't in his own handwriting. Did they say uh, the directions for the medication? Yeah, uh -huh, they said that. No, somebody said it. Right, right, right. It was his last note. All right, okay. Um, well, it's Friday afternoon, so I can't expect perfection. Um, that was pretty good, five out of six. The last one was his college ID that was written in his handwriting. So that was a little tricky. His, his ID card there was all filled out by him in his handwriting. That was a little sly, but we're in college, his ID. Uh, all right, well, I have... I have um, the way to get you all down front, because I know this is the Catholic thing, right, to sit in the back. But down front here, and I hope you'll come down and take them, I have a beautiful little prayer card. This is Pierre Giorgio with the Beatitudes on the back, and then four special cards of his with different things on the back, the mountain climbing and the pipe. You know, you've got to have the pipe, the one with the smelly cigar in his fingers, um, the climbing the mountain with Verso Alto. And then this is a very special card that um, was touched to a relic of Pierre Giorgio. So... There's six beautiful cards down there. Come down and take advantage of those, and let's close with a prayer. Um, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O oh, Father, you gave to the young Pierre Giorgio Frassati 
the joy of meeting Christ and of living his faith in the service of the poor and the sick. Through his intercession, may we too walk the path of the Beatitudes and follow the example of his generosity, spreading the spirit of the gospel in society through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed Amen. Pierre Giorgio Frassati, pray, pray for us. Pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Come on down. Take a, uh, take a little door prize. And then, of course, as usual, we have the reception over in the great room.